Hey guys, welcome back to my channel or welcome if you're new here. Today we are going to talk all about sources of nutrition. So we're going to talk about the three energy nutrients, proteins, carbohydrates, and fats. And then we're also going to touch on vitamins and minerals. So if that's something that would help you in your nursing class, then stick around. Okay, guys, so let's get started with our sources of nutrition. So again, we are going to talk about the energy nutrients as well as vitamins and minerals. Let's get started with carbohydrates. So carbohydrates are our body's most efficient form of energy. And that is the main role of carbohydrates in the body is to provide that energy necessary for cellular work. So whether we are sitting on the couch and our heart is beating and our lungs are inhaling and exhaling, we need energy. We also need even more energy if we're gonna do anything active like exercise. Now, when we have sufficient amounts of carbohydrates in our body, that carbohydrate will regulate the fat and protein metabolism inside of our body as well. Now, when we don't have enough carbohydrates, we do know that our body will metabolize fat for energy and eventually will also metabolize protein for energy. And that is not what we want. We want sufficient carbohydrates so that they can do their best work providing energy to the body. Now, carbohydrates are organic compounds consisting of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, and they are primarily found in plants. 45 to 65% of our total caloric intake should be from carbohydrates. And just as a reminder, carbohydrates do provide four calories per gram. Now we do have two types of carbohydrates. We have simple carbohydrates and we have complex carbohydrates. Both are gonna provide energy, but our complex carbohydrates are also going to provide fiber. So simple carbohydrates are gonna be monosaccharides, such as glucose, fructose, and galactose. These are the most easily used by the body because they digest very, very quickly. So monosaccharides only consist of one molecule of sugar, and you can see them right here. So they digest through our body in about 15 minutes, and then that sugar or glucose is available in the bloodstream for use to convert to energy. However, disaccharides, those are going to consist of two sugar molecules. Um, and examples would be sucrose, maltose, and lactose. Those are still going to digest pretty quickly. Now, they do have to be broken from disaccharides into monosaccharides as they travel through our digestive system, but still broken apart very, very quickly. Complex carbohydrates on the other end consist of more than two sugar molecules that are bound together. You can have very long chain polysaccharides. So that's how they are going to provide energy as well as fiber. So examples would be starch and then of course, dietary fiber. These are gonna take much longer to digest. However, complex carbohydrates are our best source of energy. They are also the best at maintaining euglycemia, which is normal blood sugar. Now, complex carbohydrates are going to come from grains, legumes, and vegetables. Grains are going to be our best source. And you will notice that these are all plant foods, um, wheat, oat, barley, beans, peas, and then on the vegetable side, potatoes, parsnips, yams. That is starch. Dietary fiber is indigestible. This is going to pass through the body without providing any calories or nutrients, but it performs really great work inside of our body. It's going to provide bulk to the chyme, so to thicken the chyme. It's also going to ease the work of the GI system. It's going to lower our cholesterol. It's going to reduce numerous types of cancers, but in particular, gastrointestinal cancers. And again, it's going to stabilize our blood glucose. So the microflora in the fiber is what is also going to help to synthesize vitamins in our body. Now we do have two types of fiber. We have soluble fiber, which is going to dissolve in fluids. It's going to thicken substances. So oatmeal, the inside of an apple, legumes, and then we have insoluble fiber, such as the outside of the apple or something like popcorn. Now it is important to remember that Females need at least 25 grams of fiber daily, and males need at least 38 grams of fiber daily. Okay, let's move on to fats. Now, the role of fats in our body is numerous, but one of them is as a secondary form of energy. So when we don't have enough carbohydrates in our body, either because we haven't eaten enough of them or because we've used the energy that's available from them, our body will break down fat in order to have energy for life-sustaining functions. Now, of course, we do know that breaking down large amounts of fats can be dangerous to the body. 
So breaking down fats produces ketone bodies. If those ketone bodies build up in our system, it can actually lower our pH and lead to metabolic acidosis. Now fats is our densest form of energy, providing nine calories per gram. Now there are some other roles of fats in the body. They are going to provide specific characteristics to our food, such as palliability, satiation, and satiety. So palatability is what makes our food smell and taste good, right? Things that have fat in them always smell and taste really good. Satiation is increasing our desire to eat more fatty foods. So if you eat one slice of pizza, your body always wants a second slice of pizza. And then satiety is preventing hunger in between meals. So the more fats that we eat, the longer that we can go without being hungry. Fats also maintain physiologic health. So they, again, are stored energy. That energy is stored in our adipose tissue. That adipose tissue protects our organs. Fats play a role in hormone production, in temperature regulation, structural material for cells. And then they also transport our fat-soluble vitamins, which are vitamins A, D, E, and K. Fats are organic compounds made up of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, and they do not dissolve in water. We need 20 to 35% of our total caloric intake on a daily basis to be from fats. However, we want less than 10% to be from saturated fat. Actually, ideally, we want less than 7% from saturated fat. And then we want a low intake of cholesterol because we know that high intakes of cholesterol are associated with cardiovascular disease. Lipid metabolism. So fats are going to be absorbed in the small intestine. The gallbladder is going to secrete bile, which is going to emulsify and break down that fat into smaller, more easily digested particles. And then the pancreas is also going to secrete pancreatic enzymes, which are also going to help the body break down fat. There are three types of fats. There are triglycerides, phospholipids, and sterols. Let's start with triglycerides. These are also called fatty acids. So you have three fatty acids plus a glycerol in your chemical composition, and this is the largest class of fats. Moving on to phospholipids, this is also called lecithin. This is two fatty acids and a phosphate that are chained together. These are acting as emulsifiers. So they're soluble in water and fat at the same time. And they transport lipids through the body, forming structures also of our cell membranes. And then the last is sterol, also called cholesterol. This is necessary to make bile, vitamin D, sex hormones, cells in the brain, and our nerve tissues. They're only found in animal products. So remember, essential nutrients are those that are necessary in the body, but for which the body cannot synthesize. So we have to eat them in order for them to come into our body. Non-essential nutrients are those in which the body can synthesize whether we eat them or not. Let's talk about saturated and unsaturated fats. So saturated fats are single bonded carbon chains that are fully saturated with hydrogen. And you can see that in this picture. So you have your single carbon chain and every carbon is attached by a hydrogen atom, so fully saturated. So hydrogen atoms are attached to all available bonding sites. Saturated fats are solid at room temperature and palmitric acid, which is found in animal foods, is a great example of saturated fat. Monounsaturated fats mean that one of our double bond carbon chains is unsaturated with a hydrogen atom. And you can see that in this picture. So here's our long chain of carbon atoms. We have this double bond right here in the center, and it is not saturated with hydrogen atoms. That is a monounsaturated fat. Oleic acid is an example, and we find that in olive oil, peanut butter, peanut oil, and avocado. Polyunsaturated fats are where we have two or more unsaturated double bonds. And you can see that here in figure C. So here's a double bond number one, double bond number two, and neither are saturated with hydrogen. So these are our essential fatty acids. We think about omega-6, which is linoleic acid, and omega-3, which is linolenic acid. Now, omega-6 found in vegetable oils and some animal foods. Omega-3 found in fish, canola oil, walnuts, and soybean oil, wheat germ, and green leafy vegetables. Now, essential fatty acids, omega-3 and omega-6, very important to heart health. 
So what is that relationship? Well, these omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids are essential to make prostaglandins. Well, prostaglandins have really important functions in our body. They regulate our blood pressure. They make sure that our blood clots appropriately, help us produce gastric acids and help with muscle secretions, and then also help to form our immune response. Blood cholesterol is cholesterol that actually is in the blood and associated with risk factors for heart disease. So the transportation of cholesterol in the blood occurs with lipoproteins. The more weight of the lipoprotein, the higher the density. And we do have three types. We have very low density, we have low density, and we have high density lipoproteins. Now, really important to remember that HDL is our good cholesterol. So that's the one we want to be as high as possible. And LDL is our bad cholesterol. That's the one we want to be as low as possible. And of course, here is that total cholesterol panel. So of course we can check total cholesterol, which really we want to be less than 200. Our LDL, again, ideally less than 100. Our HDL, again, between 40 and 60. And then our triglycerides should be less than 200, ideally less than 150. Remember, HDL is good, LDL is bad. Food cholesterol is the cholesterol that we actually eat. The recommendation is 300 milligrams or less per day. Remember, saturated fats are going to have more cholesterol. So those are the foods that we want to eat in moderation. Let's move on to proteins. The role of proteins is going to be to provide amino acids that are used to synthesize protein for body processes. So this is another backup energy. So carbohydrates are our primary source of energy. Our secondary source is going to be fat, but if necessary, our body will break down protein for energy, which we really don't want, right? We need uh, protein for our muscles and, and body maintenance and body growth. So we really don't want protein being broken down for energy. Proteins provide four calories per gram. They help us to, again, maintain and grow our tissue. They play a role in our immune system response, so they help us develop antibodies. They help with fluid and electrolyte regulation, acid-base balance. They help us create hormones and enzymes. Now, we do want 10 to 35% of our total caloric intake to come from proteins, and what we, the way we calculate adequate protein intake is 0.8 grams per kilogram for a healthy adult. Now, proteins are organic compounds. They're formed by linking amino acids. So they are consist of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and this is what makes them different, a nitrogen atom. Now we do have some essential proteins and then we also have non-essential proteins. So remember our essential proteins are the ones that we need to eat in food in order to get them in our body. And I have listed them for you at the top of the screen. We have complete incomplete and complementary foods. Now complete foods are protein foods that we eat and they contain all nine amino acids. The only sources of complete protein foods are going to be from animal sources and the only vegetarian source or vegan source is going to be soybeans. Now incomplete protein foods are those that lack one or more of the nine essential amino acids. However, we can eat what are called complementary foods, which combined together will give us complete proteins. So a great example is a peanut butter sandwich. So we have the peanut butter, we have the bread, when we put them together, we will get a complete protein food providing all nine amino acids, essential amino acids. We have 11 amino acids that are non-essential, meaning they can be made by the liver. So we don't have to eat them to get them in our body. And I have listed those at the bottom of the slide. Now, remember, proteins are made up of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, plus a nitrogen atom. Now, nitrogen equilibrium is where we are consuming foods in equal amounts of what we're excreting. So we're taking in enough nitrogen and we're excreting enough nitrogen. That's equilibrium. That's what we see in normal healthy adults who are eating a well-balanced diet. A positive nitrogen balance, this is where we're retaining more nitrogen than we're excreting. And we see this in children, right? Children who are growing, so they need extra protein in order to grow we also see that in pregnant women who are trying to grow a baby, and we also see that when clients are recovering from illness. Now, negative nitrogen balance is where more nitrogen is excreted from the body than is being retained by the body. So we're breaking down more tissue than we're building up. 
Now this occurs due to aging, but also we see this during illness, extreme stress, and during states of starvation. Okay, let's move on to our last sources of nutrients, which are gonna be vitamins and minerals. So the role of vitamins in the body is to provide cellular metabolism. So they don't actually produce energy. Remember carbohydrates are best source of energy. Fats and proteins are all available as sources of energy in our body. However, without vitamins, then our body can't synthesize and use that energy. So they are necessary um, in our body to use energy. Now, all of our vitamins are essential except vitamin D. Our body can make adequate amounts of vitamin D on its own through the exposure to sunlight. So if you don't get enough sunlight exposure, you won't have enough vitamin D in your body and then you will need to eat it. But vitamin D can be made by the body. We can have primary deficiencies of vitamins. This occurs when we don't eat enough foods that contain vitamins and we can have secondary deficiencies that would occur due to like a malabsorption syndrome. So Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, cystic fibrosis, anything that impairs absorption uh, for, of nutrients from the small intestine into the body or into the bloodstream. We have water soluble vitamins and fat soluble vitamins. Let's start with water soluble. We have a whole bunch of B complex vitamins that are water soluble, thiamine, riboflavin, niacin, pyroxidine, folate, vitamin B12, biotin, and pantothenic acid. Also choline and vitamin C are water soluble vitamins. These are gonna be vitamins that dissolve in water. Our body is full of water, which means they're very easily eliminated from the body. So toxicity from the overconsumption of water soluble vitamins is pretty rare. However, deficiencies are gonna develop very quickly because they are so easily eliminated from the body. Fat soluble vitamins, there's only four, vitamins A, D, E, and K. These are gonna dissolve in fatty tissue and they actually require bile for their absorption from the small intestines. Now these are harder to eliminate from the body because they're gonna be stored, excess is gonna be stored in the liver. So the risk for toxicity is high with these four vitamins. So anyone that has liver disease, this is a concern. So they want to make sure that they aren't over consuming fat soluble vitamins. Now absorption is dependent on the body's ability to absorb fat. So think about again, those clients with malabsorption syndrome. So cystic fibrosis, celiac disease, Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, those people are going to struggle to, to absorb fat soluble vitamins from foods. Let's move on to minerals. Minerals provide structure and strength, particularly to our teeth and bones. They allow for our muscles to properly contract and release. They influence the way that our nerves function. They're cofactors for enzymes, meaning they help enzymes work in our body. They maintain a proper acid-base balance and they are required very importantly for blood clotting and then also for tissue growth and repair. Now we have two types of minerals. We have major minerals and we have trace minerals. Major minerals, we need to consume at least hundred milligrams or more per day. And those are going to include calcium, chloride, magnesium, phosphorus, potassium, sodium, and sulfur. Remember that chloride, potassium, and sodium are all electrolytes, very, very necessary to maintain homeostasis within the body. Now, trace minerals are those that we need less than 20 milligrams per day. Those include chromium, copper, fluoride, iodine, iron, manganese, molybdenum, selenium, and zinc. Okay, guys, that's all I have for you today on sources of nutrition. Hopefully you found that helpful. Now, don't forget, I do have a free study guide that goes along with this material. I didn't do any practice questions because the study guide has all the practice questions on it. So if you need more practice with this content, just shoot me an email and I'll be happy to send you that free study guide. Have a wonderful day and I will see you in the next video.